In this episode of Travelogue, I travel to Wujiang District on the country's east coast to explore the birthplace of silk. There, I'll discover that silk wasn't just a precious fabric, it was a way of life. Isn't this the best? So in southern China, there are lots of little water towns that call themselves the Venices of the East. But Wujiang District is a little bit different because for centuries it's been home to one of China's biggest silk producing regions, which in turn made it into a major commercial hub and one of the wealthiest places in the country. And uh, although the pace of life has slowed down a little bit, the water towns here truly are the Venices of the East. I'm Taran and welcome to this episode of Travelogue in China. I've come to the historic town of Zhenzhe, near China's east coast. It's one of several water towns in Wujiang district, where canals were highways of the past. These days, Zhenzhe retains much of its original charm, and on its cobbled lanes, the locals still outnumber the tourists. It's also one of China's top centers for sericulture. That is, the business of raising silkworms. Granted, it may not seem like it at times, what with everyone kicking back in tea houses. Well, when in Rome, so we've got rice crackers made of sticky rice, orange peel, tea leaves, sesame, sugar, some dried carrots and some dried soybean and uh, I know it looks like I'm about to have a full meal but these are actually the ingredients that go into something called four bowls of tea which is a local specialty. <laughs> Oh. Oh. <laughs> It's, it's, actually, it's actually surprisingly good. There was a lot of sugar that went into this bowl, so I thought it would be really sweet, but it's only subtly sweet. And the, um, the taste of rice is, is there. It's not too prominent, but it's there, and it's actually it's not bad at all. Now, In the past, Jinzer's tea houses would have been brimming with silk merchants talking shop. It may not look like it now, but during the Qing dynasty some 200 years ago, Jinzer was one of the wealthiest towns in China. The evidence is in its roofs. The wealthier you were, the taller your house. 
It makes sense. Only those with cash to splash could afford more floors. In fact, many of the houses in Jinza are in some way related to silk. Funny how many of these alleyways are home to buildings that have their history rooted in silk. I mean, this is Junzo's first and only bank that was built specifically for silk producers, which just goes to show you how important and lucrative the industry was. This is one of China's first privately owned joint stock banks. Its shareholders included wealthy family clans. He also funded the construction of a nearby school for their children. All this was thanks to the silk trade. So with all this talk of silk, how do you actually make the thing? Well, probably one of the best ways to find out is by visiting the Taihu Snow Silk Museum, where you can actually get up close and personal with the silkworm. So the people of Wujiang District have been making silk for at least 4,000 years, and you can tell how closely related Chinese culture is to the stuff, because even the character for silk looks just like the product. For the ancient Chinese, silk was more than just a fabric. It was a symbol of status. For a thousand years, only the emperor and his family could wear silk. Later on, when it became more accessible, the color of the silk you wore indicated your social class. So I always thought silk was just silk, but as it turns out, there are 14 different categories of silk, and within those, over 2,000 different types too. There are many different silk producers here in Wujiang District, but the ones in Jinza are known to be the best because of their excellent environment. And uh, the lifespan of a silkworm is actually pretty short, just 46 days and they go through five different phases of, I guess you call it larvihood, but the entire time they require constant attention and care. Chinese refer to silkworms as babies. They feed solely on mulberry leaves and eat four times a day. In the past, people even got up at night to check on them. But despite the challenges of raising silkworms, the practice is so widespread in this part of China that children often keep them as pets. Today, these school kids are getting an extended lesson in sericulture. Finally, after a month and a half of eating, the silkworm is ready. waited its entire life for this moment to spin its very own cocoon. When boiled, a cocoon will unravel into a single strand of silk up to a kilometer long. As early as 3,000 years ago, 
the Chinese were already using plants to dye their silks. In Zhenzhe, the culture of silk is woven into everyday life. People here aren't afraid to take it slow because they know that good things come to those who are attentive and patient. Coming up next, I visit one of China's most important silk producing regions and find out that here, People believe in a very unique deity. Ah, it's like we've reached the ocean. But this is China's third largest freshwater lake, Lake Taihu. And of the country's four main silk production centers, three are based around here because of its excellent source of water. to raise silkworms, you need a lot of mulberry trees, which requires an ample source of water. Perhaps that's why, some 5,000 years ago, sericulture was born here. Legend has it that silk was discovered by the Yellow Emperor's wife when a cocoon fell into her teacup. As it began to unravel, she realized the fine thread could be woven into something new. Today, much of China's best raw silk comes from Zhenzhe. It's home to over 200 silk companies that together produce 30% of all silk quilts in the country. In addition to being light and breathable, silk is a natural protein, so it's less likely to cause allergic reactions. Fantastic news for those with sensitive skin. It's funny how uh, usually when you hear of silk, you think of dresses and ties and nightgowns and scarves. But um, since the Tang Dynasty over a thousand years ago, the Chinese have been making silk quilts. And originally, they were only for the imperial family. And then later on, they were sold to aristocrats. And now, even people like you and I can buy silk quilts. And they're actually really important for locals because they're given away at major occasions from birthdays to weddings and even funerals too. It's not just the people of Jinza whose livelihoods depend on silk. As a matter of fact, most of the residents of Wujiang district work in the silk industry. Which is why they've come here to pray for good fortune. This is the Xiantan Temple. It's dedicated to the goddess of silk, who's better known to us as the Yellow Emperor's wife.
According to legend, not only did she discover silk, she also invented the reel that extracts fibers from cocoons and the silk loom used to make the fabric. That is a lot of incense. But then this is the largest temple dedicated to the goddess of silk in this region. And today it's a birthday. It's also, according to the traditional Chinese calendar, the festival of Xiaoman, which is also when silkworms start spinning their cocoons, and why much of the incense behind me has been donated by local silk producers. <laughs> Usually, Xiaoman refers to a period of time when crops start to bear fruit. But here, it's all about celebrating the goddess's birthday. Over the next week, amateur folk opera troops will take turns to perform on the stage facing the main temple hall. Wait, 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 wait. They'll put on plays from three different schools of Chinese opera with troops competing to gain favour with the goddess. <laughs> the villain is one of five main roles in Yue opera, which is usually performed by an all female cast. Uh, it takes a lot of work to become a villain. A lot of makeup and preparation. That was a very villainous Yes, I definitely have to work on my cattle. And since there's no particular opera about silk, the troops play whatever's popular. Everything here is free. The performers are all volunteers, and anyone can come in and watch the show. The only rule is that all plays must be upbeat. After all, it's the Silk Goddess's birthday. Coming up next, we'll learn how silk was made centuries ago, before seeing how the emperor's silks are being reinvented for the modern era. While Zhenzhe is known for raw silk, the town of Shenzhe is all about the finished product. And though many types of silk can now be mass-produced, 
There remain a few that must be painstakingly handmade. Some fabrics, such as Zhang satin, require the use of incredibly complex looms. Here, the ceramic balls act as weights that keep thousands of silk threads taut. And then there's silk brocade. There are three main types, one of which was produced locally and was called Song Brocade. It was worn by the emperors of the Song Dynasty over a thousand years ago. Wow, what an incredible piece of machinery. Sometimes it's quite hard to imagine the amount of work that goes into creating something as intricate as silk brocade, but here we have it. This was essentially an ancient 3D printer, the hardware being the loom itself and the software in those millions of threads of coloured silk. They were essentially programming code waiting to be executed, pixels waited to be printed by the master craftsman who sat here and created the finished product after many hours of hard work. So even though the design has already been set, actually creating the song brocade is an extremely complex matter because the design is sewn onto the reverse, which means the only way to check is by doing this and looking at the mirror underneath. There is, however, one place in China where song brocade is factory made. In the past, only five to six centimeters of the fabric could be hand woven every day. But now, this workshop produces 20 meters of song brocade in the same amount of time. Thanks to this increased efficiency, the exquisite designs that were once reserved for emperors are now stepping into the global limelight. Well, this looks just perfect for the First Lady of Finland. So, in the past, Song Brocade was gifted to members of the imperial family, and now it's gifted to presidents and premiers around the world. For example, these two, this was given to the President and First Lady of China during the APEC meet, and this set was given to Angela Merkel, and uh, sounding a little bit like a salesman right now, this orange backpack was for Malia, the eldest daughter of Barack Obama, and this beautiful purple piece was given to the wife of former Prime Minister of the UK, David Cameron. It's just right for her. Song brocade is not exactly casual wear. Its elaborate designs are meant to impress and lend the wearer a certain level of gravitas. I just can't see myself wearing this to work. However, thanks to new technology, song brocade is no longer limited to clothing. It can now be made into wallpaper and cushion covers so you can make your home fit for an emperor.
Even today, there are many tailors in Shengzhe that specialize in silkware. This boutique has chosen to focus on the most iconic of silk garments, the qipao, otherwise known as the chongsan. Um可以说就刚开始的话我不是一起跑来做的因为起跑的话比较难做它设计到的工艺比较多然后刚开始我还是做一些像小丝绸的小件的东西后来呢因为我觉得就是我一定要把它丝绸它本身应该有的这样的